We are a generation, 25 years. And the, in my talk today, I will use as my unit of measure not the inch, the foot, or the mile, but the unit of time, the generation. And this issue of how one generation accumulates knowledge, as the CNU has done, and then passes it on to the next generation. And how different that is at a time of big change, when the questions the prior generation addressed uh, aren't relevant, maybe, to the questions the current generation is facing. So, so we're going to talk about generations and how long change takes. I want to start this with a uh, real focus on time and everything I'm going to talk about today. So CNU's Genesis story, those of you, everyone knows it, but it's worth repeating, which is uh, the SIAM, uh, led by Le Corbusier, wrote the SIAM, uh, the Athens Charter, published it in, in the 40s during World War II. 93 years later, 53 years later, excuse me, the CNU felt the need to rebut that manifesto. So there's two competing design manifestos, two generations apart, wisdom conveyed, wisdom rebutted. What's interesting is you think about the SIAM Charter, its vision of an autocentric world didn't require implementation. The world was ready for that message. We were ready to mow down our cities. We were ready to pave the farmland, to drive cars all over the place. So what Le Corbusier launched were new trends, and that was easy. What CNU launched into was reversing trends, which is hard. The other point about our origins is the charter, like a good design manifesto, describes a sort of ideal end state. But because it was written by architects, there was no plan for implementation. It didn't include guidance on how to actually get to this kind of promised land, this place we want to be, and so on. And I think that's really what I want to focus on today. So the charter, it's a re revered document. Uh, if you haven't slept with it under your pillow for a couple of years, try it out. It's pretty, pretty good. And uh, what I want to say about it, though, is that we have, over the years, had a little amnesia and I think, frankly, started cherry-picking the charter. So we all have our favorite parts. You know, I kind of like neighborhood and block kind of stuff. But we skip over, and I want to thank Majora with a wel welcome, love, hug, embrace, seeing you, warmth thing for talking what she talked about, which is this first sentence, increasing separation by race and income. We often skip over this. Why? It's hard to do, and we like the other things. But I think in this 25th year, I think we need to really focus on the whole charter. And I know it's ambitious, and we've, we have so much to thank to our founders and those of us working thus far, but I think this is looking forward. We need to re recalibrate and define what it is we're going to be after. So my fear is not that there won't be a CNU 50 or 75 or 100. It's just that at each of those milestones in the future, we'll look back and say, did we do all we could have to implement the charter? So I'm raising a high bar and using generations as my unit of measure. So new book, not available today, uh, but later this year. But, but the research I'm going to talk, talk to you about came out of writing Sustainable Nation. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. So, um, but uh, urban design patterns for the world we want, another kind of tagline I have for it is how 100,000 self-governing neighborhoods invite change. So this idea that we're going to skip government, work in that space between the individual and the smallest unit of government to make our change. And I've also, part of the book is a pretty audacious thesis, which is that all of the changes that we see that we are feel challenged by, climate, health, equity, and so on, are attainable in four generations. The change can be done in four generations. Why four? Can, you, can I prove it? I can't prove it. What I can tell you, though, is that having looked at it, I think four generations is the longest into the future that anyone can care, and that is the life of a child born today essentially 100 years or four generations. That's as far as we can think into the future. As advanced as we are, that's it. It's a human limitation, one lifetime. So I'm going to talk to you about three trends which are at the intersection of three things we care about. Health, equity, and happiness. And those three trends are here, sprawl, obesity, and CO2. So I'm going to take you through how long change takes. And I should have said, that my, my talk today and I, I, what I hope you'll think about is not the work of individual practitioners, 
which continues to be vibrant and innovative and frothing with just excitement, but the, our collective work, the work done by the CNU organization, by our partners, and by th sort of th third parties that we influence in our work. So, but let me take you through this. So, first thing is, we took a really long dive into history and started at the beginning of civilization, Sumeria, 3100 BCE. And we define this as generation zero. And we see, when we look at civilization over that long telescope, we find three speeds of change. First gear is basically the ancients, where generation after generation, there was a lot of repetition. Innovation was slow to come. 200 generations went from, nearly 200 generations from Sumeria to, I'll show you in a minute, London and the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the Greeks, the Romans, and so on. The innovations along the way took 200 generations. Fast forward, second gear, generation 198. So this is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, the Crystal, Crystal Palace in London as a kind of iconic marker. And this is also the time that we started extracting carbon out of the ground, digging coal to power and fuel this economy. And the combination of science and technology absolutely fueled and accelerated the pace of change. The third era, the third gear, if you will, the information age, generation 204. Six generations after the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, the information age is launched, change happens faster. Um, it's also that happens to be the time where that information alerted us to the fact that this habit we had picked up six generations before of extracting carbon was now actually an urgent problem, right? And so the way I define this is at this point, civilization got its first homework assignment, and it had a due date. And it was, it was due tomorrow, basically, due tomorrow. So, so here we go. Can there be an issue that is more identified with CNU than the word sprawl? Maybe walkable communities, maybe, maybe others, but I would submit to you that sprawl is the one word that everyone in our space identifies with us. So I hope when we do our report card, we're doing really well at taming this beast, right? Right. So we, the first thing is I look for this idea that CNU needs to define its success, sort of what's our end game? You know, what is it with sprawl? Eliminate it, reduce it, keep it out of urban areas, talk it down, you know, what, what is our goal there, right? And then how do we measure our progress towards that goal? Well, we haven't defined either the goal or, as it turns out, measure any progress to speak of. One thing is measured consistently within the CNU, and that is to the human machine that is Hazel Boris. Where is she? <laughs> Where are you, somewhere? Okay, there she is, standing up. We thank her and Emily and others for compiling the list of adopted form-based codes. About 380 have been adopted thus far, and it goes back to code number one, Seaside. It's an astounding 1.5% of the marketplace of the 24,000 units of government that have zoning authority. We've cornered 1.5% of the market. So uh, we've got <laughs> progress towards goal. Uh, we've started, right? So we've got a ways to go. The other thing, and I think it's very telling of our culture, that we seem to measure with, with a lot of passion are the number of books we've written. <laughs> so it is not how many acres of sprawl did we avert or you know, how, how many more walkable neighborhoods there were year to year as a result of our work. No, how many books we wrote. So, so we, we, we suffer from what is called uh, the availability heuristic excuse me, the representativeness heuristic, which is we listen to each other. We recognize, hey, you're, doing, you're working now, that's good. Hey, we, we've won this battle, when in fact I think all of us just had jobs. So, so I think that's a very human failing, but we have it. And without, without having a target, <laughs> without having a target and without measuring your progress to it, what are we doing? So can we be here and seeing you a thousand and still feel good about our work but never have made any progress towards our goals? Absolutely, quite possible. So we're going to avoid that. So sprawl. So the first thing to share is that the U.S. population, those of you, everyone knows this, is charted to grow by about 40% by the end of the century. And my question to you is, will those new citizens live in walkable places or sprawly places? Does the CNU care? Do we have a plan? Do we have a target where we're just going to kind of let it go and let the work of our members speak as our as our voice, right? So we've done some tracking, and what you'll see here is, uh, this is now the consumption of land in terms of millions, over here, millions of acres across the United States. We're not running out of land, but we are certainly using it inefficiently. So 
up until World War II, uh, the ratio of uh, the rate at which land was consumed was proportionate to population growth. Then around World War II, for two generations, we forgot how to do that, and we sprawled at two and a half to three times the rate of land consumption per unit of population. And then this little, can, can you see that line? It's not an optical illusion. It kind of bends, kind of bends. And that I want to draw your attention to. So here's Siam, and a couple of years later, the, a new trend is launched, is let's waste land, let's drive everywhere, and, they, and the world bought it. And then CNU was launched, and I don't know if it's coincidence, I don't know if we can take credit for it, I don't know, but look at that, look at that. I would like to think that the work of our movement helped change the culture. In our, our individual projects are very important, but changing the culture is a times hundred mul force multiplier. So already, regardless of the cause of that inflection, whoever can claim credit for it already can claim that much land consumption averted. And what does that mean? What does that total? Just so happens that little kind of sliver of land is larger in size than Joe Biden's home state of Delaware. So we have prevented the paving and development of a place the size of Delaware. So uh, not a small achievement. Small state, but not a small achievement. So, so what we've done in the book is to then project forward, always you know, in 100-year bites, 100-year-plus, uh, um, the scenarios that might go forward in terms of our patterns of sprawl, our patterns of land consumption. And we, we always have a high hyper, hypo, and then our preferred, the sustainable nation. And the sustainable nation ideal, which I think should be the CNU's ideal, is that we don't need more land to accommodate that new population. In fact, we need to repopulate neighborhoods to make them more vibrant, to make them more walkable, to make them support more amenities and services that'll walk to distance. So, so we have choices here, uh, what, what is our issue? So a few things we learned putting this together. One is sprawl remains, 25 years into CNU, sprawl remains the dominant pattern of growth in America. Number two, we learned from Ellen Denham Jones that not the commercial suburban stuff, but the residential suburban retrofit is a unicorn. It does not exist. Less than five, let's call them cul-de-sac projects in, in Ellen's database, have actually been reversals of cul-de-sacs. So they continue to be created out in the world, and they are all but impossible to reverse. They're a, very much like a Superfund site, a contaminated site that you cannot fix so why do we let them ma be made anew? So I think we've got some received wisdom from, the, from our first generation to say, we don't know how to stop sprawl, we can just put it in the right place. And I think for our second generation, we need to come back and revisit that, that framing, because I think that's actually not accurate and we have too much at stake. If we don't do the sustainable nation um, scenario, I think that at CNU 50, and everyone should be here, Dan Solomon included, where are you, brother? <laughs> you, he's the healthiest guy I know, he'll be outlive me by a lot. Um, but when we're here for CNU 2050, if we don't stop sprawl, it will be the truth to say more sprawl was created after CNU was founded than before. And would we all agree that that's, that's definitely a failure? So we can't let that happen. So obesity is number two. <clears throat> First of all, obesity is a global epidemic. The United States happens to be the world leader in it. Uh, but we're not unique. You can see all the stats. The other thing to notice is that no country has peaked in obesity yet. So uh, like, like trends that we're going to talk about, some peak and go down. This one has yet to peak. So, and then the other thing is unique to the United States is the amount we spend on health care, a, se a segment of which is related to obesity. So we spend, on average, 8% 8, 8 gross domestic product more than the nearest, next nearest country. So we're not getting our values worth. I think we all know this. Um, and, then, and it functions in some ways as a kind of big sort of dripping pan for all the problems in the country end up in healthcare. And uh, we often mark it. In the, in the walkability and the, the obesity realm, we see a pattern where uh, corporations make good money on both ends of the transaction. They will sell you a sugared drink, and then a pharmaceutical company will not cure your problem, but will sell you a lifelong drug maintenance program to address the problems of the sugared drink. And so we, as, as a society, pay for both ends of that transaction. 
So how do you break the cycle? So, um, and the other thing to say is 21%, according to one estimate, 21% of all healthcare expenditures are related to obesity. So how big is that? So it's about <clears throat> three and a half, four percent of GDP, which is what we spend on defense. We spend on obesity what we spend on defense. I, I proved these numbers wrong. I would love that to be true, but that's what we, what we found. So, so what are we going to do with obesity? So the first thing is there's some scary, scary roads ahead. And this is not a judgment on individuals at all. It is just a concern about our collective wellness and well-being, and a hugely equitable issue. So the uh, Surgeon General declared it a, an epidemic in 2001. Um, we're on the path, climbing, 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 basically 1% gain in obesity uh, in America per year. And there are two peer-reviewed studies that are pretty certain will be at half the population will be obese by the year 2030. That's the path we're on. And so we haven't, not only have we not peaked, we're not even close to peaking. We're a generation, maybe two, maybe, three, maybe four generations from peaking in obesity. So as long as we subsidize both ends of the transaction, there's no reason that people should not be obese. The, the economy is making money on it. So, but what is CNU's, you know, what is our role here? I think that if we ever figured out our diets, what we would realize is what we really need is a walkable country. That every place everyone lives should have a walking option. And I think that is proudly our work. Third is CO2. So, this is one that I find in, in presenting this stuff gets a little bit mis, misconstrued. So people, you know, people are aware we have to do something to reduce our energy use and so on and so on. But this is the best framing that I've come across. It's called stranding carbon. So it's the idea, it's not like we need to be eventually an energy efficient economy. We actually need to leave the carbon underground. So and you can see the percentages of all the bits of carbon and the rate by which we need to leave them in the ground. Um, the map, map below that are the trading exchanges around the world that represent the kind of st the value, the asset value of those companies that own those underlying yet to be extracted carbon resources. And so, you know, who are we stacked up against in this premise is, you know, huge markets in London, New York, Hong Kong, Singapore, and so on that trade it and value it very highly. So f in order for this to succeed, all those pies have to be written off as unprofitable. So there's a big financial incentive, again, pulling us to pull all that carbon out of the ground uh, rather than leave it there. So uh, goal, strand the carbon. So, so here we go, there. So I'm focused on the US and what we can do here. This is obviously a, a global problem, so I'm, I'm not tricking myself, but I really want to focus on our country and what we can do. So. Um, U.S. CO2 output peaked in 2005, a few factors that may have influenced that. Uh, you know, uh, exporting our industrial output to China, we had an economic downturn, but also there are true efficiencies being added in the economy that account for this trend being a permanent reversal, and it's not, no one expects it to actually suddenly go up, uh, even with the current president and the current regime. Here are the six generations I talked about that we've sort of adopt, uh, developed a a habit, a, an addiction, whatever you want to say, to carbon starting in the Industrial Revolution, generations 199 to 204, takes us to today. And then the question is, how fast can we reverse this trend? Is anybody interested in knowing? Pretty important question, right? So, so we asked it a couple of ways. What is possible and what might be likely? Because I don't think we know enough to predict for sure. So what is desired is what Ed Masria told this Congress down in Dallas, which is by 2030, we need to be well on our way to decarbonizing our society, our buildings, our cars, uh, you know, our airplane travel, and so on. So that was an 80% reduction by 2030. And it, it's a change line that looks like that and then drops off incredibly. Is this possible? Um, first of all, to say it's 13 years away. So, you know, I was talking to somebody in the hallway, Bob Ransford, about his project up in Tawasson, and he's on like year 16 on one project, right? So we've got 13 years to decarbonize our entire economy. What are we, what are we feeling about that, folks? So first thing to say is if it was Hitler, and this was World War II, and we had a shared vision of, of the threat we faced, and we understood it clearly and what was needed, which I think was largely true then, uh, no problem. We'd actually have it 
done already. We'd have windmills all over the Midwest, we'd have transmission lines, we'd have electric cars. It would mostly be a technological fix, but we could, we could absolutely do it. So then, what is likely? So to get to what is likely, we, we did what's called a heuristic. You can't answer that question, you answer a different question that you think is relevant or similar. So we looked at smoking rates in the United States. So in 1900, uh, cigarette smoking, by the way, smoking, cigarette rolling machine was just invented. So cigarette smoking was invented in 1900, uh, became a thing, 1% of Americans, peaked in 63, uh, and then is on its way down. Surgeon General's report played a role in all of that. Um, and we, projection, who knows, you know, 2040, 2050, it might be kind of a thing of the past. So, but, you know, when you count the generations there, it's two and a half in and basically three or three and a half getting out. So a little slower to resolve than to create the problem. So then we ask this question. This is kind of the, the heuristic. If we could uh, decarbonize our economy at the same rate that we got re reverse the trend of smoking in the United States, what does that look like? So what we've done, this is just a graphic comparison. So we matched the start, start line and the peak line and then filled in kind of what it would look like. And it looks something like this. So we would be sort of a decarbonized economy around the year 2150. How's that sound? Sounds about 100 years too late. So, so I can't tell you which generation, how many generations in the future, six, eight, ten, that Florida will be a pond, uh, East Texas will be a pond. Those are fairly likely scenarios in the failure to leave the carbon underground. So, so I think the debate that I hear within the CNU to say, let's skip mitigation, because everyone's doing it, and move on to adaptation, because we own adaptation, is, I understand, a strategy, but misguided. Everyone has to do mitigation, absolutely, and everyone has to do adaptation, absolutely. We can't skip one and do the other. So that would undermine our credibility uh, and would be a gross, gross mistake. So I show you this. Our society processes this idea that I can show you a future before it's happened and you react to it and you make different, make different decisions in your life. Right? So I didn't want to actually be the guy here saying this, because I'm an optimist. But what I realized about these projections is they are just projections. They are every bit the ghost of Christmas future, of Tiny Tim's empty chair by the fireplace. I've just shown you that. But we can make different, different decisions once we've seen this. This is the first iteration. Right? People have been, we, we're surprised to come across this idea that very few people seem to do these projections. Scientists won't do them because they're uncertain. Academics don't do them because they don't help their careers. I'm not quite sure. So we're wrong in a lot of our assumptions. But please steal this, perfect it, do it again, make this a platform. So the question is, how can we change faster than we ever have? I think we can do this. So in the book, not available today, we identify six uh, accelerants of change. And I'm going to talk to you about two of them. One is campaigns, and the second one is just the really fundamental thing of how we perceive change. So campaigns. Not a presidential campaign, not a political campaign, a public health campaign, right? So there's a couple that those of us who are certainly architects and anybody in society appreciates that building codes serve a purpose. And the one thing that they've been really good at over the years is figuring out how to, how to require buildings to be designed so they don't collapse. And barring earthquakes and terrorist attacks, this is a problem of the past. So buildings don't collapse anymore. Fire, um, you know, these are both sort of concerns from time immemorial, and certainly 19th century is when you first see them showing up in the codes. But fire is also a trend that is well on its way to resolution. I don't include the slide today, but in a couple generations, it is quite possible that fire deaths in the United States will be thought of as virtually gone, non-existent, a thing of the past. So the fire marshals t of today who wield great authority are actually going to have a weaker and weaker hand in the future. And I am not saying that I care to have any additional Americans die in fires. That is not my message. No one should die in a fire. This should, this should uh, absolutely be our mission. But let me sh reframe this for you. So this is what's called health, safety, and welfare to an architect today, both of those on their way to resolution. So we add two topics 
to this idea of what is health, safety, and welfare. And those two topics are uh, accidents where cars kill people, either in collisions or as pedestrians or bicyclists. And the other data point is those deaths attributable to inactive lifestyles, essentially people who don't walk, right? And those two could be thought of as the kind of consequences of sprawl. And what's interesting about those two timelines is that the number of people killed by cars is 10 times, actually now 12 or 13 times that of those who die by fire. And then the number of people who die due to inactive lifestyles is somewhere between 30 and 80 times more people, more Americans who die every year due to inactive lifestyles. So we have used this in our practice to say to a fire marshal to say, I am obligated to help you avoid anyone dying in a fire, but I have these other competing uh, threats that I also am responsible for. I know what my profession doesn't tell me that, but I believe that. And so, and they are, you know, 12 and 80 times more lethal than the one you're concerned with. So I think you want to help me on those other ones too, don't you? And that has actually been a persuasive uh, pre uh, comment. So, so understand that there's now a reframing of what health, safety, and welfare constitutes. The old one that professionals are, hel are held to somehow excluded sprawl. It excluded the people that got hit by cars and the people that were just inactive in their lives. And that was far more injurious than anything that we were professionally tas tasked with. And so I think that there's within the, within the CNU an opportunity to claim that space and actually to change professional culture. Now you saw there that sort of flash that came back the slide. Are Steph and Liz here? I'm sure they are. Um, those of you who were at CNU too, when you signed up to join the C CNU, you had this little pledge you signed. said, I'm interested, I would like to join the CNU, and I hereby pledge to uh, defer, what was the word? It was an interesting Steph word. Uh, basically stop doing sprawl, right? And that was a pledge, and so a CNU membership, when I walked up, it's like, wow, this is really powerful. A CNU membership means something. I'm gonna have to say no or be embarrassed or something like that. So. That was a starting campaign almost a generation ago that I believe those signatures are in Steph's garage in Pasadena. Uh, I've asked them about it and that's where we think they are. So let's revive that idea because I think there is a lot of power to change professional culture. We are cultural leaders, so we could totally do that and it is not a heavy lift. We just need to do it. Oh, here we go. Hey, changing professional culture. So um, anyway, I think I've made that point. Beautiful diagram uh, by the book. So then, <laughs> um, <laughs> The second, accelerant, the second accelerant is understanding how we perceive change. So this may seem sort of obvious. What do you, what's this guy going to talk about? So I've been obsessed the last few years with this, the work of Daniel Kahneman and the book Thinking Fast and Slow and the term heuristics, which are quirks of the mind, how our brain is wired to, make a, to reveal that ba we're basically not rational. We think we are, but we're not. There's a couple of biases that, that are worth mentioning. Anyone who's been at a community meeting where your role is to sort of advocate for change will recognize the resistance you encounter. So on the left is the status quo bias, which is to say, when offered a choice, we are wired to not even evaluate the alternative before we say no. So we, we, our bias is straight ahead to keep doing what we're doing. This served us well in those early ancient periods where your elders passed on to you wisdom and you were pretty well served to repeat what they had done in their lives because you would stay alive. But at a time when change is in the air and innovation is required to meet our needs, this doesn't help us. This also manifests itself as something called the loss heuristic where the feeling we have about a loss is twice as powerful as the joy we have from a gain. And so we are wired not to like change. So that's, that's a reality, and those of us trying to do it, you know, contend with that. Now that sort of revelation about how our brains work happens at a time coincident with a lower level of trust in government. Started in Vietnam, Watergate, uh, you know, you read the papers, you know what it's all about. But you can see, you know, we're really at kind of 20% trust in government. So, you know, it's very hard to... Uh, have a country advance when there isn't a common shared trust uh, in what the future might be. So, uh, got a proposal for you, got a proposal. And this is one that seeing you can steal or ignore or whatever. Um, and that is that, can we, the other thing is we've been obsessed with and others talked about this, we are a tribe and we're all wired to be tribal. Um, and how can, is it possible to take the, our tribal wiring 
and, and get people to buy into that, that your neighbors are your tribe. And we, we behave a certain way towards our tribe. We are willing to invest time without immediate return on the expectation that the tribe is better off. We're willing to undertake specialized labor. I'll do this and you do that. All these sorts of things that you know, we used to do in the ancients and before. Now, is there any evidence that this could work? Well, yes. De Tocqueville traveled across the United States in 1830 and wrote Democracy in America, a great read. I commend it to you all. And he observed over and over to say, these Americans are amazing. No government involved. Groups, small groups of citizens get together in their community to do things. So in the day, he tells stories, you need a hospital? What do Americans do? They form a committee to build a hospital. Not government, not the individual, committee. You need a bridge across the river, committee to build the bridge across the river. This is our DNA. This is what built our country, was neighbors coming together to advance and improve their community. So we want to tap into something that's worked here for nearly 200 years. This old quote really came to mind, which is, uh, and the six founders of the CNU are the embodiment of this. Small groups of people uh, are the most powerful things. So what do we need? So here's, here's my vision, that we're a country of 100,000 self-governing neighborhoods. So you can't legally self-govern because we have this one person, one vote thing. So in terms of electoral stuff, it's a redefinition of government below the level of official, you know, chartered, elected government. It is a different structure. So we're, we in the CNU are not afraid of inventing new tools and new structures. This is the one I think we need a lot, self-governing neighborhoods. And the guess at 100,000, who knows? Who knows how many there are? We haven't bothered to map. So, but what I can tell you is this could be a platform uh, below the level of government, above the level of individual, that supports our work and we can all do at home. And I think it could be viral. We'll see. We'll see. Um, it's also worth mentioning, and this is stats I learned in Emily's great book, Neighborhood, uh, not out yet, um, and from, from uh, WalkScore, 86% of neighborhoods are car dependent. So if you lived in a neighborhood that was defined as car dependent, would you like to work to improve it to get out of that ditch, right? I think some would. So if we define it that way, I think we'll get some takers. So this is now about the book. Many of you got little kind of postcards or wimpy postcards. Um, patterns of change to improve neighborhoods. We've got nine chapters in descending order of where, where we think those conversations start in the neighborhoods. And the first one's collective effervescence. I want to talk about that in a minute. There are 70, this was not possible without a lot of collaboration. Many people, show of hands from people in the audience who are contributors to Sustainable Nation. There should be a few people here, leaders, you know them all. Great, great, thank you, thank you. So, um, but these, this is very much like a pattern language, except it's future, future oriented rather than mining the past. So, and I think they're framed rather beautifully and I'm really proud of the people that agreed to collaborate with us. So the first, just to share a sample pattern, this is from Emily's book, um, people need an everyday neighborhood to belong to. And she did, this is, was the late at night text about item seven, right, about connectedness. So, but she came up with this eight criteria for what, what is a neighborhood. Now, if anybody's on the pro herb, we new urbanists love to fight about our neighborhood diagrams. Yours is unworthy. Yours is the antithesis of what we need to do. You're an idiot, name-calling, flaming, this whole thing. A waste of time, utter waste of time. It won't, you cannot build a platform for social change with technological divisiveness like that, or kind of a institutional divisiveness like that. Emily does a brilliant thing. She finesses right over the top of it. What, is, what do you have to do to be an everyday neighborhood? Not a litmus test about Perry, Clarence Perry, or not. It's, do you have a name? Do people know that they belong to this neighborhood? So it is not necessarily even physical boundaries, it's perception, right? Because that's what people live. To Majora, I love Majora's presentations because it was so everyday, so of the people. And so a brilliant move is to um, do the, kind of ask people what they, wh whether they believe they belong or not. Extent matters, but this issue of like, do we have edges or hard edges or whatever, again, finessed. And then to me, the key one, number eight, does this have a unit of representation for the neighborhood, i.e. self-governing? Two other patterns. And I think this is really important, that, that you can't govern until there's trust, 
and you can't trust until you know people as people. And this is kind of Uncle Joe Biden, I think, was really on this the other night in a beautiful way. But, you know, use participatory art to connect to your neighbor's humanity, the work of Candy Chang. If you don't know it, check it out. Brilliant thing. Cheap paint, post-its, plywood, and so on. Uh, here's one of my favorites. Celebrate life with immersive community events guided by the principles of Burning Man. So you can keep your clothes on, you can pass a drug test, all that kind of stuff. But what Burning Man does, and I did some focused research on this topic, um, was one of the ten principles is seek out strangers. Seek out the person who's different from you. Seek out the person you don't know that maybe is, is wildly different from you. And, and engage with them and learn what gifts they have to share. And so I think we need more of seeking the stranger, and I think Burning Man is a beautiful frame for that. So, so here's my ask. So the conceit of Groundhog's Day is that Bill Murray's character wakes up every morning and is mad that today is just like the day before. And the truth is, we love it when days are the same. We're wired to want the same over and over. So my ask of you is when you wake up tomorrow morning, first of all, you hear this music, and you say, I'm going to make different changes in my professional and personal life. Thank you very much.